are you? My name is John Dwyer from VOCs. Welcome to Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, John. Always a fucking pleasure. Thank you very much for having me here. Yep. And right off the bat, John, I have a gift for you. A one-sided Sunra 7-inch from 1967. Wow, man. Thank you very much. Is this a Tour 7-inch? A Tour 7-inch from 83. Wow, man. That's 67 great. recording. I'm a fan. Thank you so much. What can I say about Sun Ra and the Tour recordings? Because you know. Um. Well, I know that uh, a bunch of his early singles are only available like this, that they were sold on the road, which was super... I mean, Sun Ra was a grassroots organization, basically. They they press their own shit at Saturn, right? And, uh, yeah, this is great. Thank you very much. I don't know all that much about them, but I know that uh, all those represses have been have been buying them up like crazy. And uh, been there's a bunch of those uh, videos through Saturn, through DVDs of their live shows and stuff. Really great. And what's interesting about this is it is one-sided. It is one-sided. Wow. It is a Are you one- being lazy or arty? Well, I was curious about this. For instance, the band The Ripoffs from California, if you look at the other side, printing a backside costs an extra 40 bucks in 1993. Well, that seems to make sense. I would say the record industry doesn't sound like it's changed very much then, huh? Do you have any connection with the ripoffs at all? Them being from San Francisco? Shane, right? Shane worked with P.D. Dammit, who used to be in my band, uh, at a porn distribution warehouse. And one time the guy, Greg, from this band called me on the phone and yelled at me because I booked a Guitar Wolf show. And I think the, I'm paraphrasing here, but he told me he books Guitar Wolf, not me. I was probably 19 or 20 years old, so, you know, I'm going to take that one to the grave. Thanks a lot, Greg. It was a fucking good show, by the way. John, you are from the OCs right now, but at one time you were in Landed. Rooster. Rooster in a box? Yeah, yeah. A uh, rooster named Svilby that had a little mullet. I got him from a booker, a butcher in uh, Chinatown who, uh, right when I picked him out, tried to chop his head off and had to stop him and tell him I wanted to take the rooster alive. I think he thought I was going to take him home to kill him. And he would come to shows with us. And uh, more specifically, I remember at a sports bar we played at where we got a lot of shit from the customers. Uh, at the end of the night, the bartender just screaming at me as I was walking out the door, uh, hey, you can't leave this fucking thing here. And I turned around and it was just him with a rooster like running around at his feet. And uh, just good times, you know. Landed. I, don't have, I don't have that rooster anymore, needless to say. Yeah, what happened to the rooster? We, my landlord forced me to get rid of him because the uh, asshole drummer, metal drummer that lived next door to me, who kept everybody up all night anyway, was upset that the rooster was growing in the morning. So we brought him to Home Depot and left him in the sea dial because in the wintertime in Providence, this is a long story, but... Basically, when you go to Home Depot in Providence in the wintertime, you'll notice that the rafters are full of birds, and a lot of birds, rather than, I don't know if they were just being lazy or what, but if they, they wouldn't fly south, they would just go to the Home Depot because it was heated, and then they would nest up in the rafters, so we figured he'd be at home there, and apparently, so I hear, they kept him as a mascot at the Home Depot for years afterwards. And it continues. Without the rooster, yeah, yeah, it's true, it's true, they just played in Los Angeles, uh, they're getting out again, you know? The experts. The experts. My first painting crew I worked on. See, I'm starting to catch on to your game here now. Uh, my first painting crew I worked on ran by this knob named Ian in San Francisco. Really high-end painting company. I lied my way into the job, and we painted Sharon Stone's house. It was the first house I painted. What can you say, John, of the OCs about the Icky Boyfriends? Icky Boyfriends are uh, a real gem from San Francisco. Uh, they were on a great label called Blackjack. Is this, is this the Blackjack one? It's Pass It Records. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. But uh, rega regardless, these guys are uh, still playing. I met him uh, on the streets of Baltimore after being a huge fan. And I, he was just randomly walking down the street in Baltimore. And I recognized him because he's the most recognizable motherfucker in rock. And I rolled up on him really young and excited to tell him how much I loved his band. But really, instead, I ended up just scaring him. And uh, he asked me uh, <laughs> what I wanted. And we ended up bringing him out to a co-trip show. And he got really hammered with us. And we've been weird friends ever since. Sor sort of friends. Like he says hi to me when he sees me. But we just did a live record for them. And it came out really good. Do you know the roots of the icky boyfriends? For instance, the leather... leather yeah, this is another great... Because if we turn it over... Uh, there's a... Uh, Anthony on drums. Yeah, he, uh, this, I don't have this one. I have their, what is the one, uh, fuck. I have their, they have an LP that's brown wax. It's disgusting. It, uh, it looks really soupy. It has, it's got some hits on it. Uh, Sugar Sandwich, was that them? Yeah, they had Sugar Sandwich. Am I right? Is that them? Sugar Sandwich. Sugar Sandwich. That's a pretty good song title, actually. So, yeah, this, I, when I fell in love with Icky Boyfriends, I started hitting up Anthony for all the vinyl he had of all his old bands. And, of course, 
because nobody gave a shit about any of this stuff, he still was sitting on, he had like a couch-shaped pile of it in his house that they would sit on. And I got managed to get score a bunch of this vinyl off them, but I've never seen this one. And we also have John Dwyer of the OCs, oh, yeah. the rock and roll adventure kids. I just spoke to Marcos on the phone. Um, he's booking the Burgerama that we're playing next weekend in Oakland. This fucking band was great. Oscar is now making tacos. He's got his own taco stand. They're called Oscar's Tacos. They make vegan tacos that are not repugnant. And Marcos is doing good. He's still playing music. He's got a bunch of bands going. Always his brother is in Gravy's Drop, I believe. And uh, yeah, these guys were great. This was one of the first nights of San Francisco, like garage scene back in the day that I thought were really great because they really didn't give a shit. Like they were kind of a train wreck at all times, you know, but in the best possible sense, you know. John of the OCs, when did you stop doing speed? Um, fuck. The last time I bought speed was off of a pregnant girl who was crying at a Safeway at like 6 a.m. <laughs> Yikes. My mom doesn't look at the internet, so it's okay. But uh, that, was a, that was a moment where I was like, maybe this isn't cool anymore. And then uh, I remember the next day I was like, my legs hurt. And that meant I was fucking too old, you know. So, yeah, I had to switch up gears drugs-wise. And uh, now I'm 41, about to be 42. So I'm sure if I did speed now, it'd probably just kill me. Unless it was uh, prescription, in which case, half a pill maybe, you know? Who is Jimmy Cornman? Jimmy Cornman? I don't know. From Casa San? I have no idea. You get a tattoo of his, and then you have free tacos oh, for life. That was Casa Sanchez. That was before my time in San Francisco, but I do know people that have the tattoo, and I know that that place stopped doing that, because I think... When they were letting people get that tattoo, they were thinking that nobody would do it. They're like, who'd be fucking crazy enough? But they didn't know how many addicts and poor artists and just general people who had the ability to get tattooed would go out for a free burrito every day and get uh, tattooed this ridiculous, like, uh, little sort of stereotypical Mexican man riding a corn rocket, from what I remember, was the, uh, the thing. But yeah, I, I actually never even got to eat at that joint. Have you ridden the Seward Street Slides? Those are those cement slides. Yeah, I did. I took acid and rode those one time. And I remember we had a really hard time finding them. They're not as smooth as you want to be, so they tore the ass out of my pants. And all I remember from that night was that some woman in a condominium that lived next to them screamed down for us to shut the fuck up. But because I was on acid, I just looked up and it was a tree. She was behind the tree yelling down at me. And I was like, we got to go right now. The, the actual landscape is digging in on us. You felt a dot-com collapse of 2000, right? Yeah, I was around for the first uh, bubble. It was a fun time. That was actually one of the best times I had in San Francisco is when all those, like I moved in, I had nothing and I knew nobody. And then like I, within the year of me moving in, this huge influx of money happened. So the it was just really interesting to see the first time where it was like mostly freaks and families that were had been living there. And then suddenly there were all these new people like just confused in the neighborhoods. Uh, getting scared. I think it used to be a little scarier, you know, so I think people gave them a lot more shit uh, in like 98 to 99 years, you know, now it's it's a lot safer. My, my roommate put it perfectly uh, years ago saying that uh, he was upset when he came home. He was like a, a big worker guy and he had a table saw under his arm and he was all indignant when he got home and he was like, uh, some guy in the street just asked me where, I could, where he could get good chocolate and he's like, the city's too safe, man. He's like, what kind of man asks somebody else where he can get good chocolates? So that's, uh, yeah, that's where it's at now. Did you pick up any good furniture? In San Francisco? Because of the dot-com collapse. No, because the first wave of people, I don't know about now because I don't live there anymore, but I know the first wave of people had terrible fucking taste. Like, they were the catalyst for all the condos that are now getting thrown up there. And any furnishings that were on the street that I saw, honestly, were, like, just really cheap, generic office furnishings. So it'd be, like, you know, or all, even, like, mainframe boxes, lots of those, but I did have friends who benefited off of taking all that shit and pulling all the gold out. Like Jimmy from that band Shotwell, who's like an old school crusty punk down there, was just explaining to me like how he was getting poisoned by extracting the gold from all the computer chips or whatever the fuck. I don't know what he was doing, but he's still alive, so it couldn't have been that bad. John Dwyer, fuck CDs. It's a, uh, it's a... Uh, uh, the Mummies. Yeah, a classic. Oh, it's an LP? What? Yeah. I, fuck CDs. Fuck CDs? Is that what you want me to say? It's uh, mummies. mummies. Yeah, yeah. What can you say about the mummies? Never seen them. Never met them. Uh, I've met Russell Kwan. Um, You're going to be playing with them. Yeah, next weekend. I've never seen them. This will be my first time seeing them. Uh, from, from behind, Russell Kwan looked like a, an old friend of mine. So often when I would see him, I would run up behind him and grab him. Or like be really way too close to him. And he would turn around and then be startled that his face was completely a different version of 
the guy who I was looking for who wasn't Asian at all, so it was always a nice little shock. So I got to start to recognize Russell Kwan from behind. But he's a badass drummer. Somebody told me that he welds his drum kit so that you can't change anything on him, which I really like that aesthetic of... Uh, that nobody can move your shit at the practice space. Yeah, they were great when I was a kid. I bought these records in Providence because they were, I didn't know who they were, but obviously I loved uh, like Creature Double Feature and all that shit. And these guys were on the same label that did Billy Childish and all that stuff. So I was getting into Garage when I was a kid. This is, well, I mean, what can you say about the mummies? What you see is what you get. I like that they always um, would quote, like, I don't know what the fuck you people are doing to our show. We suck. Shut up. Go home. Like that kind of vibe. And I bought a VHS of them, a bootleg, when I was like, 18 and it was terrible like just just off it was like they're playing for like five people in new york and nobody cares they're like booing them and that made me really excited to see them and now here i am at 41 finally about to see this fucking band after playing with them yeah 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 playing after them which really sucks thanks a lot marcos rock and roll adventure kids reference from earlier he's the one booking the show and we have another gift for you john from the ocs right here we have a supreme's postcard what are you gonna mail it back what are you gonna say about your time in canada versus the nurse's time in canada well i finally got to meet uh the great nardwar and it was everything i expected it to be he smells better up close than he does on the internet ba boom yeah yeah um i don't know we'll have to see how the night takes us i went downstairs to get a beer and all i had was heineken didn't know this was a sponsored event so i bought a whiskey but i haven't eaten anything yet today so that might have been a mistake so we're just gonna take it easy i'm gonna have some hummus and drink a big tall boy no you made it i mentioned the nurses the nurses oh, got well, held at the canadian old, border yeah. yeah they uh that was an interesting one my my old roommates band came up with us we all got stuck at the border for some reason there was some slip up they knew we were lying to get in the country this is back when we would say stuff like you know we're here to record or whatever bullshit and they they let us go. Suddenly, a guy came in, handed me our passports. He's like, "You're free to go." And I was like, "Go, go, go!" And we like went out to the car, and then immediately we got a phone call, like 20 minutes later, from the cops, and they're like, "You need to come back." And I was like, "Just keep going to the show. Fuck them." I was like, "If they really want us, they're gonna come and get us from the show." And uh, they didn't. But then they held our friends. They didn't want them in Canada. They held them for five days. They said they read old National Geographic and ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for five days. And then eventually they took them to a courthouse downtown Vancouver. And the judge like threw the case out, but like said they couldn't come back for a certain amount of time or whatever. And then just let them free on the streets, which I thought was the ultimate irony is that they don't want you here. And then they release you into the country without any, they just let them go. So they had to figure out how to get back to their car on the border and drive back. and. Yeah, that was a nightmare for them. John of the OCs, you covered the West Coast. Yeah. Uh, experimental. Uh, Pop art band. Experimental band, yeah. The most complicated name in the history of bands. Uh, great band. Uh, from what I understand, the song we covered, I found out after the fact that there was a. And I don't know, this might be hearsay, that the creep in the band wrote that song, who was the tambourine player who was really into younger women, much, much younger. And the two songs he wrote for the band both had that sort of I won't hurt you everything's gonna be okay don't call your parents kind of vibe so this was like after we covered it, my friend was like yeah you covered the song by the total potential child molester in the band I was like oh, alright great it's a great fucking song I always imagined it was more the devil talking to somebody which totally makes sense in retrospect with a man talking to a much younger what about the crowd reaction to that tune we haven't we've never played that one live there's a lot of songs we do on records that we don't play live like I've never played that song live I have another gift for you, John Dwyer of the OCs. What can you say, and here is a gift, Eric Satie. Oh man, amazing. Um, this is great, thank you. Um, I don't know, beautiful pianist, far out, really sp tons of space, really melancholic, heavy. I remember listening to it, looking out the window of a train, and it made me too sad to listen to it, and I did, I did like undo it by listening to the Stooges. Uh, it would make Bridget cry, probably. Very old school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very heavy. I like that. From what I understand, I don't know much about him, but I know that uh, the way he wrote his music out, that it was sort of up for interpretation later on. So people's interpretation of how they're supposed to play and what exactly they're playing varies from player to player with him. I don't know if that's true. It might be bullshit. Google it. I didn't. But uh, yeah, I always thought that was kind of cool that it's like it would change per the person's personality and their vibe, you know? Yeah, he's fantastic. Highly recommended. And John, just winding up here of the OCs, we have a whole bunch of records right here. The Switch On series. What can you say about the Switched On series? Uh, Wendy Carlos, right, is uh, from my hometown. So like the two big claims to fame uh, from my hometown. Wendy Carlos, James Woods, Videodrome. Uh, James Woods is always playing a creep in the movies. Wendy Carlos, uh, 
early electronic. Switched on back. Uh, just amazing. Also, uh, transsexual really early on, which I think in that circle, it seemed to go by without anybody even uh, blinking an eye, which is amazing that Wendy Carlos was able to uh, become a woman and people are just like, it's cool, she's amazing. I think that Amazon, like, when did that happen? Like the 70s? Pioneer. Pioneer. And underneath we have? Uh, switched on Rock, the Moog machine. Uh, Moog covers of uh, Moog, shit, sorry, covers of uh, heavy rock songs. This one's actually really surprisingly great. Switched on Santa. If you like your Christmas records, this one is uh, highly recommended. If you want to get weird, freak out your grandmother. I've never actually heard this one. This series goes on and on and on. They don't have the uh, switched on country switched on screwdriver. Does that exist? That baboom. Terrible idea. Yeah, baboom. Um, yeah, I haven't heard this one, but I'm sure it's good. It's got a electric udder. That's disgusting. And underneath it, you, can you see that? It says Moog coming out of the cow's mouth. Genius. John, it is kind of a momentous occasion. You were not wearing shorts. Yeah, yeah. But can you give us an update? The glass, the glass in the knee. It's still there, man. It's uh, yeah, it's right there. You want to feel it? No, it's okay. <laughs> but that's uh, pretty serious. I only wear shorts on stage because I, if I don't wear shorts on stage now, I rip my pants and I only have one pair of pants. I'm a simple man. And uh, yeah, I just don't like being hot anymore. I live in LA. I'm hot all the fucking time. I don't, I don't want to be hot on stage. I like to be loose. So I also stopped caring what I looked like on stage a long time ago, so it doesn't matter to me. There is no more PD, and you have two drummers now? You replaced PD with two drummers? How the hell are you going to replace Petey? Yeah, we had two drummers when Petey was in the band, too. We had Lars Finberg and Mike Schoen playing for like a year when we did the uh, Floating Coffin tour. But uh, I always liked that. We had I had two drummers in a band, Landed, had two drummers for a while years ago, so I always liked that. Uh, you know, The Dead and uh, Butthole Surfers, lots of uh, Sheila E, Prince. There's a lot of good bands with two drummers over the years. I think the Allman Brothers and shit, right? Or the Doobies, one of those guys. Anyway. Uh, Tim Hellman has replaced PD officially. Fantastic bass player. First time I've played with a bass player since landed is this guy here in this band now, which is crazy, but yeah. Thanks to Michelle, Panache lady, for setting this interview up. She's uh, Michelle. You can't say no to Michelle. John, lastly here, have you ever seen a camel? Yeah, I saw a camel in France of all places at a gas station. That's a really weird, did, did I, somehow I feel like you knew that already. You're like, I already know, but I want to hear you say it. But yeah, uh, yeah, we were uh, gassing up the, the damn car in France and uh, I was smoking a cigarette and I parted two bushes because I heard a sound and there was a camel tied in the field right next to a gas station, just like on the highway. French camel, weird. Well, thanks very much, John, of the OCs. Keep on rocking in a free world and do do loo do. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nardo. Our pleasure to meet you. Uh, do do loo do. Am I supposed to say that again? <laughs> do do loo do do. Uh, do do loo do. Do do. Yeah, there we go. Cheers. <laughs> you know, I watched the interview with you and Ty, and I think you scared him a little bit. Is he broken? Does this happen at the end of every interview? It does? Am I supposed to just leave now? Yeah? I'm gonna take all the stuff you gave me. <laughs>